My name is Robert Barr. I work as the library director for the city and borough of Juneau. And on behalf of Juno Votes, the Juno Empire, and K2 Public Media, I want to welcome you to this candidate forum. We're here today so that the public has one more opportunity to hear from our candidates for the Alaska House of Representatives and the Alaska Senate. Juno Votes is a nonpartisan collaborative community project created this past spring to increase voter registration, voter education, and voter turnout in Juno. Juno Votes got started in large part thanks to the City and Borough of Juno Assembly, who determined that one of their goals a year and a half ago needed to be to increase voter turnout. Two local elections ago, we had a turnout of 19%, um, which means that less than 10% of our voting population was deciding those issues on that ballot. Our turnout for general elections tends to be better in the 60% range, but still plenty of room for improvement. We were happy to see a 10% increase in voter turnout in this year's municipal election, and we hope to see a similar increase in the general election next week on Tuesday. So a reminder for all of us here and for all of our listeners, early voting is open now. You can vote now or on or by December, or sorry, November 4th, not December. Uh, if you'd like to connect with Juno Votes, you can do so on Facebook, facebook.com slash Juno Votes, or you can email us at Juno Votes, all one word, at gmail.com. Our moderator today is Lisa Fu, news reporter for K2 Public Media, and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Robert. Welcome to At360 for this Juno Votes Candidate Forum. First, let me introduce our candidates and panelists and explain the format. Representative Sam Keto III, a Democrat, is running for House District 33, which encompasses downtown Juneau, Douglas, Gustavus, Haynes, Skagway, and Kluckwan. He is opposed by T Peter Dukowitz, a Republican, who is unable to be here today. Hoping to represent the Mendenhall Valley and Auk Bay in House District 34 are Republican Representative Kathy Munoz and Democrat George McGuan. Senate District Q covers all of these areas. Senator Dennis Egan, a Democrat, is running for re-election. He is opposed this year by Republican Tom Williams, who is also unable to be here today due to a previous engagement. Our panelists are Katie Moritz of the Juno Empire and Casey Kelly from KTOO Public Media. The first section of our forum will last 40 minutes. Panelists will pose questions to the candidates who will have one minute to respond. Candidates, please direct your attention to Andy Hirsch. Andy is serving as our timer today. When you have 10 seconds remaining, Andy will raise the red flag. This is your cue to wrap up your response. At one minute, she will ring the bell, signaling that your time is up. After our first round of questions and answers, we'll begin a lightning round of questions requiring 15 second responses. If time allows, we will take questions from our audience toward the end of the program. Abby Lowell with the Juno Empire is collecting written questions and we'll give them to our panelists later in the program. And thank you to our audience for coming today. And now I turn over the floor to our panelists and candidates. So I'm Casey Kelly from KTOO Public Media and I just uh, will ask the first question for the candidates for State House. So, this is just for Representative Keto, Representative Munoz, and Mr. McGuan. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Keto for this question. If elected, what will you do to promote bipartisanship in the House of Representatives? Thank you, Casey. Uh, I, I think one of the key things for being in the legislature is being able to work with other people. And I think working uh, across the aisle and across the state to move the state forward is really important. Um, key things that I will do is maintain open relationships with all the members of the legislature and be willing to listen and discuss issues of importance to Juneau, Southeast Alaska, and the rest of the state with all of the representatives in the legislature. Okay, Ms. Munoz. Thank you, Casey. Um, very important to have a strong bipartisan philosophy and, and um, in that vein, I've been active with the Coastal Caucus, a member of the Bush Coastal Caucus, uh, and we have very similar interests, uh, coastal region, uh, including in the coastal region, including port and harbor development, alternative energy. There are a lot of ways that we can work together, and we have very successfully. Um, I also have a record of working across party lines on legislation. I've worked a number of times with 
with my colleagues in the minority to promote minority legislation as well as majority legislation that have co-sponsorships of uh, the minority members. And Mr. McGuan. Well, as a common guy like I am, I would just go into everyone's office and say hello and sit down and, and meet all of the um, House members on both sides of the aisle. I'd probably invite everyone out to my house for dinner and um, simply get to know each other and find out where our common ground lays. And I think that goes a long way to establishing a positive relationship. Um, I'm Katie Moritz. I'm a reporter for the Juno Empire, and this question is just for Senator Dennis Egan. Um, you've been caucusing with the Republican-led Senate majority for two years. Will you continue to do so, and how has caucusing with them affected your relationship with your fellow Democrats? Thanks, Katie. I, I make no commitments. I caucused with the Republican majority because the majority was, was representing Rail Belt Alaska, the roaded system. There was no representation uh, in coastal Alaska from a fisheries, mining, uh, the ferry system, things like that. I thought it was very important for someone from Southeast Alaska to join the Republican minority or majority and uh, face issues uh, head on that, that directly affect us. Main issue, of course, keeping the capital here in Juneau. Our next question is for all of the candidates, and we'll start with Representative Munoz. Uh, the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention just ended, and overwhelmingly the message was that the state has come a long way, but still has a long way to go to recognize and respect Alaska Native people and their traditions. Give one example of how you have or will advocate for issues important to Native people. Early in my term, I, I worked to develop a relationship with the tribal governments. We um, particularly were interested in working with the Department of Transportation and the tribal, local tribal governments on transportation development. Uh, since then, we've come a long way in improving our relationship with, with tribal entities, and I've been very much a part of, of that effort. Mr. McGuan. One of the things that I think would be uh, really beneficial would be to get back to uh, native subsistence rights being handled by um, being less obstructed by the state government. Um, I think that they rely on those um, resources quite heavily and, and have every right to get first crack at them. So I would work with uh, leaders both native leaders and in the House to make sure we can um, move in that direction. Senator Egan. Yeah, thanks, Casey. I was a co-sponsor of a piece of legislation by Representative Jonathan Christ Tompkins uh, from Sitka uh, to recognize native languages. I'm. Um, dismayed that it took so long for the governor to sign it waiting for the AFN convention. However, uh, it was a very emotional evening in our Senate chamber uh, that that happened. Um, I've always been a tremendous supporter of, of, of Native issues. Uh, one example, I was endorsed by Sea Alaska Corporation. Representative Keto. Thank you, Casey. Uh, so as a, a Clinkett Haida tribe member and a Sea Alaska shareholder, I'm a strong supporter of, of native rights, native subsistence rights, the ability for uh, native Alaskans to have a unique relationship with the state, one that actually promotes public health and safety. One of the key issues right now is public safety in a lot of communities where we've got VPSOs trying to provide public safety in a few communities or a fair number of communities, but there are still quite a few communities that are not protected, uh, that as well as encouraging the state to work directly with the tribes on uh, judicial issues. So right now the state is working a, a little bit on family issues, but there might be an opportunity for tribal courts to actually expand and do uh, more to really help smaller communities. And this is a collaborative arrangement that could be beneficial for the state as well, because the state uh, has an uh, interest in promoting public safety in, in smaller communities. Okay, and Representative Munoz. Oh, 
I oh. think I answered that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You can answer again if you want. <laughs> so Mr. McGuan will be the first to answer this next question. Um, do you think Governor Parnell's Choose Respect campaign is working? And what's a new way Alaska can tackle its chronic issue of domestic violence and sexual assault? I think that the uh, Choose Respect campaign is a great idea, but it's lacking funding. And so it's not as successful as it should be or could be. Um, obviously, getting into the minds of young people that abuse is not OK is the best way to, to prevent adults from becoming abusive, right? So it seems to be cyclical. And if you can break that cycle of abuse early on, that would be the best way to prevent it going forward. And how do you do that? It would, I would suggest getting into schools and, and really teaching that there's got to be respect, um, both in, in all ways. I mean, we always have to respect our women and, and treat them fairly. And abuse is never OK. I, I agree with the concept. The problem is the follow through. Look what's happening in the issues that are now pertaining to the Alaska National Guard. Um, we had to tackle these things head on and when complaints of sexual abuse come to light, uh, they ought to be handled immediately. They shouldn't go on a back burner and have some higher up, in this case, member of the guard, uh, try to shove things under the table. I mean, it's totally wrong. But the chose respect concept is, is a great idea, but we have to follow through. Okay. Representative Keto. Thank you. Um, I think the Choose Respect program is but one component of trying to make sure that everybody in Alaska is safe in their communities. So one of the other aspects, I think, promoting Choose Respect, trying to make sure that everybody respects everybody else, but then also providing it the ability for somebody to call uh, 911 and be reasonably assured that in a short period of time they're going to receive assistance. That doesn't happen in a lot of smaller communities. Uh, I think we should be able to try and work towards that happening in, in smaller communities. Um, the other aspect is also the, the judicial, the ability for um, our judicial system to adequately protect people that are victims of abuse um, without having to, I mean, anonymity can help, uh, but also the ability for them to feel like they can go to people in authority and that their interests or their concerns will be represented and protected. So I think it's a multifaceted choose respect is only one component. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Thank you. I think the choose respect campaign has been successful in raising awareness. Um, I think we can continue to fund domestic violence uh, prevention programs, education, um, also the shelters. We've uh, worked, Senator Egan, and Representative Keto and I have worked to fund uh, projects that have come forward that have been suggested. Infrastructure projects, the new expansion of the AWARE shelter, and other projects around the state. So continuing to support those that are on the front lines uh, through education and through infrastructure development is very important. Okay, thank you. So our next question is uh, for all the candidates again, and we'll start with Senator Egan. What, if anything, should be done to amend the state's oil tax system this legislative session and over the next 10 years? Well, I voted against Senate Bill 21, and I still have concerns about it, but the people uh, said they want it, and so we have to live with it. I, I uh, against tweaking it next session, but I think in years uh, in the future, we have to uh, do some tweaking. I'm, I'm really concerned about what is happening right now. The price of WTI crude was hovering around $80 a barrel today. And that brings a severe blow uh, to the finances of the state of Alaska. It was Senate Bill 21 when the price of oil is low. Um, we have a severe decline in oil revenues. 
Representative Keto. Thank you. Um, I think one of the key things we need to look at is we've got low oil prices. We're getting 90% of our revenue from oil taxes and royalties, and I think we really need to make sure that we're continually working with the oil tax system so that the state of Alaska is maximizing what we're receiving from the oil companies while not taking away from their ability to go out and, and do exploration. I think the uh, repeal of SB 21 would have done that, and I think actually with 50, almost 50% 50 of the people expressing concerns over SB 21, there are opportunities, I think even this session, for us to go back in and look at see what we can do to try and make sure that the state is getting its fair share. And Representative Munoz? At one area of the bill that I think will, uh, of the law that will be looked at is the, in the area of the new oil provision. We, we added extra incentives for new oil production, but those incentives, we did not put a time frame on, on uh, receiving that incentive. And so I think when the legislature comes back and when we start to reassess SB 21, that that will be one area that, that will be uh, looked at very closely. Mr. McGuan? Well, I'd like to see SB 21 play out in the next session, the next year, um, and just see if there is any increase in production. I personally voted to repeal SB 21. I think it was a raw deal, but if we're going to put our trust in oil companies, let's see if they follow through. So I'd like to see it just maintained for a year, and then moving forward, I'd like to deal with uh, if there's no increase in production, if there's no increase in revenue, I think we can go to those oil companies and say, or if there's no in increase in, in uh, employment, we can go and say, hey, you didn't follow through on any of these bargain, bargaining chips, and now it's time to reevaluate. Okay. Um, now we have another question for all the candidates, um, and we'll start with Representative Munoz. Do you believe the state is on the right track when it comes to developing a natural gas pipeline? Why or why not? Yes, I do. I think that we've made tremendous progress. Uh, the, the state is working closely with the three major producers and with TransCanada. We uh, have put together the pre-agreement for a 25% ownership stake, which eventually, once the line is developed, will result in anywhere between $3.5 billion and $4 billion in revenue annually to the state. So I think we're definitely on the right uh, path. Uh, we have made significant step forward. Um, and now we will come back in the next 12 to 18 months to uh, take the next step, and that would be the, pre the engineering and the design work that would be necessary to build the line. Okay. Mr. McGuan? Well, I think we're heading in the right direction. I don't know if we're on the right path. Uh, we need to get that gas line built. It's going to help diversify the economy, but I'm afraid what it will look like if we have the same people who negotiated SB 21 negotiating the deal of the gas line. It, um, it may end up being a little too fair to the corporations. Okay. Thank you. Senator Egan? I voted for the gas line bill and I'm very proud that the Coastal Caucus along with Senator Lyman Hoffman from Bethel got a provision in that piece of legislation that provides a percentage of revenue to rural Alaska. Juneau, believe it or not, is now rural Alaska. Juneau, Sitka, Kodiak. Uh, we need a piece of the pie, and we have a provision in the uh, LNG legislation that provides revenue, goes directly to rural Alaska energy needs. People that aren't directly connected to that gas line. Thank you. Representative Keto. Thank you. So one of the things I think we need to be very careful as we're moving forward is in recognizing that this is going to be the largest project of its kind in the world. Mm -hmm. so 45 to $65 billion is a lot of money. Our share of that is fairly significant. So I think it's very important. I think the bill that is out there, the legislation, will keep us moving forward. I did vote against the legislation. There were a few key reasons why I did. Uh, but I do believe that the state has to be an, an owner in the facility in order to actually make it work. We can control parts of the schedule that way. Uh, but we do have to be really careful because we are going to be putting billions of dollars of our money in as an investment. And there, there are possibilities the project will not move forward or will fail. We need to make sure we're very diligent as we move forward to make sure that doesn't happen. 
doing that, we need to make sure that we've got the money to put forward into the project so we make sure that we are uh, well protected. So I, I think it's very important to be very careful moving forward. I think the bill that's out there will do that. Thank you. And we have our first bell ringing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next question, we'll start with Mr. McGuan, Mr. Egan, then Mr. Quito, and Ms. Munoz. Many people in Southeast Alaska are concerned about transboundary mines. What role should the legislature take when it comes to addressing mines that straddle the Alaska-Canada border? I think we are all justifiably concerned with those transboundary mines. Um, if you just look at what happened in Mount Polly, um, it's, it's scary. Um, the legislature should work as closely as possible with the senators and with the governor to interact on our behalf with the Canadian government and with the British Columbian government. I don't know, other than strongly worded letters, what the uh, legislature itself can do, but that's why we have diplomats and, and, uh, and heads of state to work on protecting our interests, especially our fisheries and our natural resources here. So I would say that we should all get together and, and really encourage a, a active role in deciding how to move forward with transboundary mines. The general delegation has met uh, more than once with the Department of Natural Resources, <coughs> the Department of Fish and Game, and expressed our serious concern about things that are going on in something we have very little control over. I think that it, the state of Alaska ought to be involved in all negotiations for the watershed, per se. The, the mines are in Canada, but a lot of the discharge comes into uh, Alaska or Fraser River, and it affects our Alaska fishery. I think we have two world-class mines here in our district that we can be very proud of. But issues that happen at Mount Polly as an example and some other things from KSM that <coughs> develop uh, really concern me. Representative Keto. Thank you. I think it's uh, really important for the legislature to work very closely as we can with our congressional delegation to try and make sure that any concerns that we have regarding wa water quality or habitat that uh, are uh, affecting Alaska through transboundary rivers are able to be addressed by us as well so that we are involved in or at least able to work with their permitting process. They have kept us informed um, or they kept the state informed, uh, different mining companies as they move forward, uh, but I think there, there might be a role for a more formal arrangement between the state of Alaska and some of these permitting operations to make sure we protect water quality and habitat. Ms. And I, I agree with the previous comments. We have requested specifically a review, uh, a position of review uh, over any new developments that happen on the other side of the border uh, through direct con. We've made the direct request of the um, governor as well as the commissioners um, in a letter that was just recently <coughs> sent. Um, also, we recently with the Tulsaqua mine uh, two years ago, we established what was called a Taku River task finding. A, a task force. force, there you go. <laughs> and and there was a lot of um, concern between the property owners and the fishermen and so on over potential barging on the river. And we, we were able through that process to, to, to determine what the, the actual plan was with the mine in terms of the barging element. And at that point, they, they told, they assured us that barging would only, only happen during the construction phase. That now, we just recently heard, is, is expanded. So we need to have a more active um, involvement in, in, in that particular issue, which is very close to home. Thank you. Okay, um, now we'll start with Senator Egan. Um, critics of the state ferry system say it's subsidized too heavily by the state general fund. Do you think this is a fair criticism? Where should the money come from to keep up with the rising cost of operating the state ferry system? Well, I'm chair of Senate Transportation, and that's been a major issue the last two years. With the elimination of TLU, the former federal funding, uh, 
opportunity. And now with a thing called Map 21, Alaska has a lot of, uh, lost a lot of funding uh, for issues like the marine highway system. Through efforts of Senator Ted Stevens uh, years ago, uh, the Alaska Marine Highway System is now part of the federal highway system. It's our highway. The, the problem is a lot of people, when you, you leave coastal Alaska, they have no clue about the marine highway system. They don't understand that it's a highway. And we have to work diligently to make sure those funds are uh, maintained at the highest level we can and to build and renew our vessels. Thank you. Um, Representative Keating. Thank you. Uh, the Department of Transportation recently released their Southeast Area Transportation Plan. Their preferred alternative actually shows a relatively stable uh, amount of funding for the marine highway system anticipated for the next 20 years. Um, I am concerned about the level of subsidy, but I think the marine highway system can be managed within the existing subsidy, possibly even finding efficiencies within the way the, upper, the marine highway system operates. Uh, but I think the existing system is actually uh, the system that we should be supporting. I'm concerned about adding too much new infrastructure and trying to actually, I think Juno Access is a concern because we're actually continuing to have marine highway system activities in northern southeast. Um, because of the Katsahine Terminal, we're still going to, we're also going to have an extra 60 or 70 miles of road to maintain, so there's going to be an increase in cost without a significant decrease in the marine highway system. So I think there are opportunities that we can look at within marine highway system for savings. Thank you. Representative Munoz. Thank you. The marine highway system is vital to coastal Alaska, and this is where being a, p a part of the Coastal Caucus makes such a big difference. When we're able to come together during the budget process and advocate for the marine highway as a, as a, a group of a dozen or more legislators, it, it makes a, a very big difference. Um, we also recently funded two new ferries, the Alaska class ferries, um, at $120 million, which was a major commitment toward the marine highway system. And both of those ferries will be constructed in, in Ketchikan at the Ketchikan shipyard. Thank you. Mr. McGuan. I applaud those efforts to keep um, manufacturing jobs here in Alaska. I thank you for that. Um, the Alaska highway system is, or marine highway system is expensive. It's, um, it's part of what it takes to be a strong capital though. I think without the access provided by the marine highway system, we become less accessible and we become uh, less able to hold on to our seat of government. To say that it's subsidized too heavily, I think is just uh, untrue. I think it's part of what it takes to keep the capital here and, and it should be maintained and, and um, I wouldn't support cutting the, the budget unless we could find efficiencies like uh, Representative Keto mentioned. Thank you. We'll start with Mr. Keto next. Do you support universal pre-kindergarten for Alaska students? And if so, how would you fund it? Um, absolutely, I do. I think it's one of the, the key things that we can do as a state to try and make sure that we're competitive in the future. Um, funding is going to be an issue. I think we've actually, in House Bill 278, we did pass tax credits that are available to provide some funding for pre-K programs. There are other opportunities within the existing system to provide uh, um, um, unique or different uh, ways of funding things that don't have to come ge directly from the general fund. So I think we can capitalize on some of those opportunities without putting the whole program into general fund spending. Okay. Representative Munoz. Thank you. I do support expanding the uh, pre-K programs in Alaska through what uh, we we call the quality rating system. And it's a, a proposal that is uh, being worked on by the Department of Health and Social Services and is ready ne nearing uh, the date where we, can, we will have legislation drafted. And what it would do is to um, provide incentives to daycare providers and Head Start programs through a quality rating system. And if a facility met a certain level of um, uh, education standard or um, the infrastructure was of a certain standard, then they would uh, be eligible for direct uh, state assistance through grants to that particular program. Mr. McGuan. 
I would love to see universal pre-K available throughout Alaska. Um, part of my platform for running is to fully fund education, and that would include funding pre-K. The investment we make in pre-K pays dividends immediately and over time, and there are some really interesting methods of funding um, that have been tried in other communities, and one of those that I've heard is um, a social impact grant or uh, bond, and that would that would require some investment to fund a pre-K system, and then it would pay dividends based <coughs> on the success rate of that s of the pre-K system. That's just one idea. I think it is the state's priority and responsibility to make sure we we do educate our, our children and, and that would start with pre-K in my, in my tenure. Senator Egan. I'm a huge supporter of pre-K education. Um, it's benefited uh, our granddaughter and it makes a huge, huge difference. One of the big things that uh, has occurred in Alaska is a group called Best Beginnings. Uh, it's an incredible group of folks that are involved in educating pre-K children. And in fact, they've won national awards. I think that there's no thing better than to fund pre-K and K through 12 education and our university system. There are future, uh, if we have to cut, none of that is something I'll be voting for. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll start with uh, Kathy Munoz now. Um, the entire UA system underwent cuts last fiscal year, including staff layoffs at all campuses. What can the legislature do to protect Alaska's public universities? We have a fantastic public university system, and I've been a strong supporter of uh, the university system as a whole, and particularly the UAS campus and the expansion uh, in, in the area of vocational education and a uh, number of other programs. Uh, re during the last budget process, we did uh, fully fund the teacher contracts through the budget process. I think we have excellent faculty. We need to support our public education system, and I'll continue to do that in my role on, in the Finance Committee. Thank you. Mr. McGuan. Well, going back to the last question, it's, it's essential that the state educate its children, and part of that costs money, and we cannot make cuts to education and expect to move forward and grow in an appropriate way. So whatever it would take to fund education fully would be my highest priority, and that would include the university system. Um, obviously, if we can get enrollment up, we can um, earn revenue that way and, and offset the cost, but it's going to be a cost. It's a cost that we all take on in order to better our society, and so it's worth it in my mind even if it does cost us a little bit extra money. Thank you. Senator Egan? UAS is a godsend for this region. Uh, it's an economic driver. Every dollar that goes to UAS returns somehow to most of the citizens of this community. Uh, look at the building George wired during construction and made it, it th that facility is incredible. In fact, in the summer, they had to rent it out as a Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> um, but you have to remember that we're competing with other campuses, with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, the University of Alaska Southeast is sort of like the small stepchild with all this, and we have to work our darndest to make sure that Southeast Alaska retains the funding that, we're des that we deserve. Thank you. Representative Keto. Hey, uh, thank you. The university system in Alaska is very strong. I'm a product of the university system, got my engineering degree from the University of Alaska in Anchorage, and I think one, two of the key things that we can really do, one is to try and make sure that the university is affordable for Alaskans, mm -hmm. that we're not charging our students too much so they end up out with a whole bunch of debt. So. Um, 
whatever I can do to try and make university affordable for Alaskans, I'm going to do. Uh, the other item is distance delivery. We have a, a, a broad geographic area in Alaska that we serve, and I think it's very important to capitalize on that and modern technology to make sure that we can provide distance delivery for uh, university students as well as providing some of that benefit to our high schools and in, in smaller communities. <coughs> Um, so distance delivery and, and trying to figure out how to make sure that uh, ed, uh, university education can be affordable for Alaskans. Okay. For our next question, we'll start with Mr. McGuan. What can the legislature do to promote a healthy tourism industry that provides more year-round jobs for Southeast Alaska residents? Well, it's pretty clear that the tourism industry shuts down around uh, this time of year and um, in order to to keep it a year-round industry I, I just don't know that you'll be able to do that without attracting all the snowbirds in the world I mean without global warming really hitting hard I don't think we're going to be able to keep our tourist tourism industry going um, uh, all year round however uh, pro promoting Local hire, I think, is a great way to keep the tourism industry strong in that you would keep uh, a lot of that money here in the in the community, and a lot of those jobs would be for for local community members. Um, and then maybe focus on developing some of these uh, winter activities and and promoting that throughout the lower forty eight. Senator Egan. Thanks, Casey. <coughs> Tourism best management practice uh, here in Juneau has made great strides on local hire. I hope it continues. A lot of this involves the municipality, but we have um, a lot of funding now with a change in legislation in the past couple of years that increases income for the residents of Juneau. You think that it's coming out of city coffers, um, it's not. It's coming through cruise ship fees that the industry pays to better uh, at least downtown Juneau and, and even uh, out the road. I think that we can uh, promote winter tourism. Look what's happening at Eagle Crest. We were number two in Powder Magazine last year and we're vying for number one this year. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to get uh, winter tourism here in Juneau. Mr. Keto. Uh, I think the cruise industry will never be year-round in Southeast Alaska. There might be some uh, opportunities to promote some smaller tour ship uh, um, activities in the winter months. I think uh, Senator Regan said trying to capitalize on winter tourism activities such as skiing, bringing people into the region. Uh, maybe there's opportunities for some more ski areas in the area. Uh, but. Uh, we do see a lot of those cruise ships that are here in the summer actually do winter someplace else. So I, I don't know that we're going to be able to have a, you know, that, that I don't know how many people who are into cruising would be interested in coming to Alaska in the wintertime. Uh, but we do have opportunities, I think, to try and, and work on our infrastructure locally to make um, winter activities may be more accessible to people that want to come to Alaska and, and experience snow and ice. So that's something that they all talk about and we can provide it for them. Okay. And Representative Munoz. Thank you. Uh, Senator Egan and I worked on the legislation that directs the, a, a portion of the passenger fee directly to Juneau and we also have a local passenger fee. So together I think we're getting about $13 per passenger that goes directly to the to the city for infrastructure development, and that can be used during, you know, for development that benefits winter tourism as well as summer tourism. Uh, we also have uh, supported the uh, tourism marketing program. We have a very robust marketing uh, program in place. We have a marketing program through ASME, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. So we continue to support not only ASME, but also our, our Division of Tourism and their marketing efforts. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll start with Senator Egan now. Um, if elected, what will you do to address capital creep and keep government jobs from leaving Juneau? I've been involved in committees 
that have fought the capital move since 1972, and I'm still a member of the Alaska Committee. It's been a major issue time and time again, but I'm pleased that your delegation has worked hard at stopping any significant legislation to move the capital, and uh, we're very vigilant on capital creep. We had uh, an issue here last month that the state was moving a whole bunch of jobs out of Juneau. It didn't have anything to do with moving jobs out of Juneau. It had to do with a whole bunch of workers that were temporary hires to handle the primary election. And, but we got blamed for capital creep. I mean, I think we're doing well at trying to save the jobs that we have. There is, no matter what you read, some downturn in state government, and we're working our darndest and trying to keep them here. Thank you. Representative Keto. Thank you. I think one of the key things that we can do is, is make, I mean, a large uh, amount of the uh, employment in Juneau and, and other parts of Southeast are government supported job state of Alaska and what we, one of the things we can do is really strengthen our retirement program so we have the ability to recruit and retain um, people that want to come into southeast Alaska to work so that will help keep people from taking jobs or not taking jobs in southeast that they end up uh, offering in Anchorage um, I think being very diligent in, in tracking the federal government slowly migrating to uh, jobs to Anchorage and I think we need to make sure that we are the capital city they have uh, plenty of representation at the federal level here in, in Juneau. I think uh, making sure that departments know that there are key benefits to having um, employment in southeast Alaska and that, that, uh, that they lose some of that if the jobs start to move all up north. Thank you. Representative Munoz. Thank you. We have invested a great deal in the infrastructure, the state capital project, the Department of Fish and Game building, the Department of Labor building. And by making those investments, we improve the uh, ability to retain employees in the capital city. So that's been one of our, our key goals. We also um, regularly get reports from the Division of uh, Personnel monthly reports on job movement, you know, jobs coming into Juneau, jobs going out. And we have had no loss in jobs in the last four or five years that, you know, we closely track uh, job movement. Whenever we hear of a threat of a potential job moving, a high paying job or a division, recently we, we learned that the Division of Emergency Management System, I think, was, was um, slated to be moved to Anchorage. We, we met with the commissioner, we advocated for the jobs to stay in Juneau and they did stay in Juneau. So it's that kind of um, approach to the issue. Thank you. Mr. McGuan. I agree. I think it is just a, a matter of, of behaving civilly and explaining our position to the administration um, and, and anyone who might consider moving jobs, especially high paying jobs to Anchorage. Um, if we can all just come together and, and rationally discuss what these jobs mean to our, our city and to rural Alaska, um, it will, it should be a pretty straightforward conversation and based on respect and, and mutual understanding. Thank you. Uh, next question starts with uh, Sam Keto. How can the legislature help Juno begin to address the lack of affordable housing? I think the legislature has the ability through uh, possibly some appropriations to help affordable housing but also in working directly with the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation to make sure there are opportunities for um, construction of affordable housing. Um, I think the Juneau delegation could work uh, directly with the city and borough of Juneau to make sure there's adequate land available for affordable housing. Um, I think what we have is housing that is available in clumps, so there are certain uh, uh, demographics and certain price ranges that are, are not generally available and I think if we can look at those areas and figure out how to increase the housing counts in those areas, we can actually see some, some benefits. We have a low um, vacancy rate, and, and when you sell a house, it goes pretty fast, but I think there are opportunities to actually um, balance the, the housing system in Juneau. Representative Th Minion. Thank you. The um, city of Juneau has established a local affordable housing fund, and it, it's meant to help with uh, 
providing the, the, the gap funding, if you will, for, uh, for projects so that they can pencil out. We can do something like that on a state level as well. Um, it was also mentioned uh, that Alaska Housing Finance Corporation plays a key role in development of affordable housing. There are two proposals that are in the de development stages in Juneau, uh, one for low-income housing and one for senior housing, and we're, both, we're supportive of both of those efforts. Mr. McGuan. Well, I have firsthand experience uh, struggling to find affordable housing here in Juneau. Um, I'm still a renter after 10 years almost. Um, one of the things that recently came up is a uh, federal program. The, the, the rural designation by the USDA has allowed for a, a very low interest rate and a zero down payment available to a certain income class. And I would encourage anyone to look into that who might be looking for a home at this time. Um, I would also support the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. I think they have some, some great programs, everything from just uh, the loans in the, in the first place to the maintenance and the, the uh, energy rebates that are also available for uh, keeping up these, these really, really expensive homes that we pay so much to get into. I agree with everything that's been said. We just completed meetings on affordable housing here Juno is the site of a statewide conference. We brought people in from the lower 48 to educate us and, and give us ideas and answer ideas and questions that we had. And it went over very well. And I'm proud of the folks in Juno that participated. The um, folks at the Alaska State Housing Authority or, or Alaska Housing Finance um, Corporation, uh, we've met with them. The delegation has met with them just recently and there are different groups in the community that are putting plans together and once those plans are complete they will be meeting with and uh, meeting with the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation trying to get funding we're looking at grants from different uh, individuals in the state and nationwide to uh, increase affordable housing here in Juneau I think uh, you know, we're making strides Um, Representative Munoz will s start it off. What do you see as the biggest issue of the upcoming session? Uh, the budget. We have um, concern about the revenue coming in and the expense of state government. So balancing the budget is number one. Uh, we'll also continue to, uh, to I think, uh, deal with the issue of the National Guard through uh, hearings and, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's sorry. We sorry need to move forward with the gas line. Thank you. Budget, gas line will be major, and also my number one priority is keeping the capital in Juneau. Okay. Thank you. Uh, budget, full funding for education, making sure the gas line moves forward, and uh, making sure that uh, we're uh, not balancing the budget necessarily, but managing the amount of money we have and the amount of savings we have. Thank you, Representative Keto. Okay, Mr. McGuan answers the next question first. Will you vote for or against the ballot measure legalizing the recreational use of marijuana? I will vote for the legalization of marijuana. I'm voting against. Um, I'll vote against. I have concerns about the ability to police uh, um, operating of vehicles. Okay. I'm uh, against. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll start with Senator Egan this time. <laughs> Um, will you vote for the, will you vote for or against the ballot measure to raise the minimum wage? I'm voting for it. I think it's long overdue. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. For it, absolutely. I'm for it as well. Thank you. I'm for it, and it's not only long overdue, it's also not enough. Thank you. Uh, next question starts with uh, Representative Keto. Will you vote for or against the ballot measure to require legislative approval of large scale mining in Bristol Bay? Um, I'll be voting against it. I'm concerned about having a uh, political level on top of the uh, state's uh, technical level of review. Okay. I will be voting against it for the same reasons Representative Keto stated. I will be voting against 
that ballot measure as well because it it puts the legislature in the position of of an expert on on the situation and and quite frankly we have enough of those already i'm voting against it i don't want politicians being engineers chemists scientists that's not our business okay uh, representative munoz the Geno Access Project, yes or no? Yes. No. Yes. No. Thank you. Well, that was easy. Um, next question starts with uh, Mr. McGuan. Do you support amending Alaska's constitution to allow public funds to go to private or religious schools? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I voted, we, we stopped SGR 9. And absolutely not. Private no. funds should not be used for public schools. <laughs> <laughs> or public schools should One not be. One at a time, please. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. Um, who are we start? Oh. Mr. Egan. Okay, sorry. That Senator Egan, last time. I always get confused. <laughs> you had me um, last time. Well, this one. <laughs> <laughs> Who's getting your vote for governor? Bill Walker and Byron Mulhot. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill Walker. Governor Parnell. Walker Malat. Thank you. Okay. And our last lightning round question, uh, we'll start with Representative Keto. If elected, will you appear on Alaska Robotics News? <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Weekly, at least. <laughs> I did a Christmas skit with Doug Isaacson, a representative from North Pole. Yes, I'll do it again. <laughs> of questions from the audience. Sure, and I, we can start with uh, Representative Munoz. Um, this is a question about fisheries. Actually, we have two questions, so I'll ask the first one, and Katie can ask the second one. Um, what can the legislature do to increase value-added seafood processing in Alaska? This last uh, session, we passed legislation to provide a, a development credit for uh, salmon processors to to better utilize a product and to create new products and it's innovative efforts like that that I support and I think we continue to uh, to look for those opportunities. Mr. McGuire, well, if we want to encourage local um, processing, I think what we should do is create a stronger. Um, I sh we should impose restrictions on on the export of our natural resources to be processed in places like China. We supported uh, the Frankenfish legislation that directly affects Alaska. And we also uh, saved Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. There were some legislators that wanted to get rid of it, and we saved it. Uh, fisheries is world class especially here in Southeast Alaska and Southwest Alaska. We have to maintain it and provide all the help that the legislature and the future governors uh, can give fisheries. I think the tax credit programs that Representative Munoz mentioned are an important aspect to increasing value added for Southeast Alaska fisheries. Uh, I think there are also maybe some opportunities with branding, so Copper River, um, Reds have, have actually been branded and sell very well, and I think we can enhance that branding for Southeast Alaska fisheries, not just salmon, to make sure that people are requesting our salmon over um, Atlantic salmon or other salmon species, uh, because we've got some of the best water here in Alaska, and I think Southeast can, can uh, benefit from that. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question will start with Mr. McGuan. Um, what can the legislature do to foster development in undeveloped fisheries? I think that with anything, you're going to have to look at things logically and 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 focus on how can we how can we do this in the most effective way possible. So while I may not be an expert on on developing undeveloped fisheries, um, I think you'd look at you know new markets. Where would those undeveloped fisheries be sold? Who would be interested in developing those fisheries and how could we encourage it? And whether that's with tax credits or with grants going to uh, establish those fisheries, I think that would be the way to move forward to develop an undeveloped resource. With the tax credits that we passed last session, um, Port Frederick 
is being developed, which is going to be exciting uh, for shellfish. Uh, a lot of great opportunities on Prince of Wales Island. I mean, it's thriving there. And hopefully it'll, it'll expand here into further areas here in Southeast Alaska. I think we have great opportunities and the sky's the limit. We just have to stay out of the way. Thank you. So we've got some very high quality uh, products coming out of Southeast. We've got uh, Acura processing that is some of the best in the world. I think utilizing our relationship or interactions with the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, we can identify underserved target markets and, and work with those uh, fisheries to see what we need to do to try and bring more fish into market that we can get out and market through, uh, through ASME. Thank you. Representative Munoz. Thank you. I think the tax credit program is really essential to developing new products. Um, I also um, believe that supporting ASME and, and looking for new markets is, is also important. Just recently, ASME went to the Philippines for the first time and held a major seafood exposition in Manila. And that, that's a country that relies, I think, 70% or, percent, 70 or more of their protein is seafood-based. So there's great opportunity to, uh, uh, to expand in some of the Asian markets, and that's what we're, we're focusing on. Another question from our audience, uh, and we'll start with uh, Dennis Egan. Do you see part of your role as uh, educating your constituents about issues, and if so, how do you propose to do so? I really don't understand the question. However, I mean, we meet with the constituents on a daily basis. In fact, I'm going to be late here for another one. Um, I mean, our doors are open. You know, it, it's, it's not interim for us. We're meeting all the time with people in our districts and also people out of the district trying to solve issues that constituents have on a personal basis, a lot of those, and we try to resolve uh, issues with government and uh, with, with other municipalities as well. I mean, I just, uh, Casey, I think that's what you asked, but I'm not positive. <laughs> So I would say I actually am educated by my constituents. I think I learn a lot more from them than I think I could actually provide to them. But there are opportunities where with my engineering background or my work around the state that I can bring a different perspective to a discussion, which I don't know if that would be considered necessarily education, but um, I think it's, it's um, having an open discussion. Go ahead. Representative Munoz. Oh, thank you. Um, well, being very involved in the community, I, I attend community events regularly. I also uh, work year-round on constituent I issues with the Juno delegation. Um, we, you know, we're meeting really on a daily basis, solving problems for for people here in the community and throughout the region. Uh, so, b being very active, I think, is the key, and being involved in the community. And Mr. McGuan. Well, I think I agree with, with everybody who's spoken so far, especially in that as far as what I've learned going door to door in this campaign, I've been educated a great deal by the constituency about what the issues are here. Um, if I were able to present any expertise, any knowledge to, to the constituency, I'd like to do so in some sort of a public forum like a town hall meeting and, and then get their feedback. On, on issues that would directly affect the constituency here in Juneau. That concludes our forum. I'd like to thank the candidates for their time and engagement with the panelists and the audience. Thanks as well to our panelists, Katie Moritz and Casey Kelly. Thanks to Robert Barr and Andy Hirsch with Juno Votes and Juno Public Libraries. And thanks to our host, KTOO Public Media and 360 North. For those who could not attend today's forum or who want to listen to it again, KTOO will broadcast the program tomorrow night at 7 p.m. on 104.3 FM. Video and additional coverage of this forum will also be available this week. Be sure to check out the Juno Empire, junoempire.com, and ktoo.org. The general election is Tuesday, November 4th. Early and absentee voting is already taking place at the State Office Building downtown and Mendenhall Mall in the Valley. More information is online at elections.alaska.gov. And once again, thank you for attending today's candidate forum and be sure to vote.